Amen. So 2 Samuel chapter 2, uh, I think that the topic here in this chapter is the topic of loyalty. I think we see several different examples of loyalty in this chapter. And what I want us to understand about loyalty is that, you know, not everybody has it. Not everybody is a loyal person. And the reason why I think is because of the fact that in order to be a loyal person, you have to be willing to pay its price. You know, there's a price for being loyal to somebody. And in our lives, you know, we're going to have opportunities uh, to prove our loyalty or to prove the fact that we don't have any loyalty uh, through our relationships, through the relationships that we have in our lives. We're going to be given these opportunities to either prove our loyalty or prove the fact that we're not loyal in certain relationships. And I want to just look tonight at several examples of loyalty in this chapter. And the first one I want to look at is the loyalty of the men of Judah, the loyalty of the men of Judah. It says there in verse 1, And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said unto, and he said unto Hebron. And David went up thither, and his two wives, Ahianoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, <coughs> the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did David bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Verse 4, and the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Of course, David being from the house of Judah, these were his, uh, his kinsmen, these were his uh, men of his fellow tribe. But notice there that those men came to him. And notice also that David, you know, he inquired of the Lord whether or not he should go up. So, you know, just uh, real quick, David is not forcing this. David is asking God, do you want me to do this? Is it time for me to go reign? You know, he's not saying, okay, Saul's dead. Now it's time for me to just take over. He's going up there, you know, as the Lord commands him. And when he gets there, he's not trying to bring everybody under his thumb immediately. He's not trying to just make everybody subject. And what happens here is we see this, this display of loyalty on the part of the men of Judah. He didn't show up and say, okay, guys, Judah, show up. It's time to ordain me king. They came of their own accord. Why? Because these were loyal people. They proved their loyalty. Now, Again, the idea is that if you're going to be loyal, you're going to have to pay its price. You're going to see that in every one of these instances of loyalty. And here with the men of Judah, they are loyal to David. They show up without being asked. They come and they anoint him a king over the house of Judah. And I want us to notice that it puts them at odds with Israel. You know, it, it makes them, you know, the, the rest, the other nations did not come. You know, Benjamin didn't come. The other, not nations, but tribes didn't come. It was just Judah. So they've automatically ostracized themselves from the rest of the nation, the other tribes. And, you know, we know the story. It takes another seven years before the rest of Israel comes around and, and accepts David as king. So that is the, the proof of their loyalty. You know, they show up proving themselves to be loyal people. They came without being asked. They said, hey, David's one of ours. He's going to be king. Let's go and anoint him king. And again, it put them at odds with Israel. There's a price to be paid for being a loyal person. There's going to be a price that's paid. That's why not everybody's loyal. Not everybody wants to be a loyal person because of the fact that sometimes they're not willing to pay that price that comes with it. To be loyal is to choose sides. That's what it means to be a loyal person. You're going to have to pick sides when there's a conflict. You're going to have to choose to be loyal with this person when there's an issue. And that's something that's just throughout scripture. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. There's not going to be anything new tonight, but these are the truths that we need to hear again and again and be reminded that loyalty is something you want to have in your life. No one's just going to stumble into being a loyal person. You're not just going to wake up and one morning and just be a loyal person unintentionally. You have to decide where your loyalties lie. You have to decide who you're going to be loyal to so that when, that time, when the time comes when it's tested, that loyalty is tested, you know, you remain loyal. You don't want to decide who you're going to be loyal to, you know, uh, in, in the midst of a conflict. You want to already know this person is somebody I'm going to be loyal to through thick and thin, okay? You know, this is something that's throughout Scripture. Joshua, you know, he told us to, you know, he told the children of Israel to choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites on whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What's he saying? Choose who you're going to be loyal to. Pick a side. If you're going to be a loyal person, you're going to have to pick a side that's going to put you at odds with other people. 
You're there in 1 Peter, look at chapter, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the, t- in the time, in, excuse me, the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. He's saying, look, Christ suffered for you. It's time for you to be loyal to him. You should no longer live the rest of his life, of his time, excuse me, in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. You know, in the Christian life, you have to choose who you're going to live for. You have to choose whether or not you're going to be loyal to the flesh or you're going to be loyal to God. That's a decision we all have to make. And until you make that decision, you know, you're going to be halt between two opinions. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they, those that we used to run with, think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. Say, so you used to run this excess of riot, but now you've changed. Now you've got a different loyalty. What have you, what have you done by becoming loyal to Christ? You've put yourself at odds with other people. That's the price that has to be paid to be a loyal person. If you're going to be loyal to be with somebody, there's a good chance you're going to put yourself at odds with somebody else. <clears throat> and here's the thing about loyalty and, and having to make this choice, having to choose a side, is that being indecisive makes you loyal to no one. If you're just, if you're just trimming the hedge, as they say, you know, riding the fence, you're not loyal to anybody. Loyalty is choosing who you're going to you know, give your allegiance to. For Judah, you know, they showed up and said, we're going to make David king. We're going to follow him. They made that choice. You know, an example of this is marriage. I mean, that's one of the vows you make. You pledge yourself to that person. You know, a, a man or a woman is not loyal to their wife because they haven't committed adultery, you know, yet. Well, I'm loyal because I haven't done it yet. No, they've already made the pledge that I'm going to stay loyal. They've already made that decision. Do you follow what I'm saying? They've already made that decision. I'm going to keep myself unto them and forsake all others. They've already pledged that loyalty. They've already made that decision. So that's not something they're going to, you know, fall into. That's not something they're going to do. They don't wait to have that loyalty tested. They've already made that decision. So I think that's what we see here from the loyalty of the men of Judah is that it's something you have to choose. And when you choose, there's a price to be paid. It's going to put you at odds with other people. And that's why a lot of people don't want to pay that price, because they don't want to be at odds with anybody. But then again, if that's the case, you're not, can you really say you're loyal to anyone? How about the loyalty of Abner to Saul? The loyalty of Abner to Saul. Look at verse 5. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord showed kindness and truth unto you, and I also requite you this kindness, because ye have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened and be valiant, for your master, your master Saul is dead. And also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. But Abner the son of Ner, the captain of Saul's host, took, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Maenaim, and made him king over Gilead, over, and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David. So we have the loyalty of Abner to Saul. If you remember, Abner was the captain of Saul's army. You know, he was the one that was leading that charge and was there at all the battles and all that. And the proof of his loyalty here is that Abner, you know, he didn't use his political clout to establish himself as king. You know, he was, if you, if you remember 1 Samuel 9, 1 Samuel 14, you, you learn that, that Abner is actually Saul's uncle. He's his elder. And it, it very, you know, stranger things have happened, and we see other instances in the Bible where people see a vacuum in leadership, and they step in. You know, they try to fill that void themselves. They put themselves in that position. But I think here with Abner, what we're seeing is that he's, he's still loyal to Saul even after he's dead. He's being loyal uh, to his kin and to Saul and to his memory by not using his following, his clout, and putting himself in that position, but rather lifting up his son uh, uh, and putting him in there. I mean, he could have made an attempt to make it to the throne. He could have tried to get that, but he didn't. And Israel very well may have followed Abner. They might have said, yeah, Abner's the guy. I mean, he's been going in and out. He's been fighting all the battles. He's been, you know, at Saul's side this whole time. Who better to lead the kingdom 
than Abner. I mean, Abner easily, I, in my opinion, could have just stepped right in and probably filled that role, and people probably would have gone right along with it. But I believe that Abner was a loyal man, and he was loyal. Now, in chapter 3, we're going to see where he switches sides. I understand that, but that's because his loyalty isn't appreciated. You know, and I'm getting my head, ahead of myself a little bit. But his loyalty uh, is proven in that he remains loyal to Saul even after his death. What was the price of Abner's loyalty? Again, it put him at odds with other, other people. Look at verse 11. And, that, and the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven, and six, seven years and six months. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the, uh, the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Maenaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, the, and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. I mean, they're literally opposing each other. They're sitting across from this pool. That's what his loyalty cost him. He said, oh, okay, Judah's going to take David. Well, you know what? We're going to put our own guy in power. We're going to put Ishbosheth in power. I'm going to be loyal to Saul, put his son in there, and now I'm going to be at odds with David. I'm going to be at odds with Judah, with my brethren. <clears throat> Verse 14, and Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, let them arise. So they have this, this war. And, you know, this is what I'm trying to get across tonight, is that loyalty in your life is going to cost you something. It's not going to come cheap. That's why, that's why people choose not to be loyal. They don't want to pay the price. Loyalty to Christ is going to put you at odds with people in this life. It's going to put you at odds with circumstances in this life. Loyalty to Christ is going to put you at odds with life. It's going to put you at odds with this world. Guaranteed. You, there's no way around it. We can't, we can't avoid that. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Probably one of the biggest uh, you know, struggles out there is, is mammon, money, what the Bible calls money. A lot of times, Christians, we have to decide, where does my loyalty lie? Is it with money? Is it with making money? Or is it with Christ? Is it with the church? Is it worth serving God? Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. I mean, Jesus specifically, you know, narrowed in on this particular point of loyalty. He said, no man can serve two masters. Well, not, well, I can. No, Jesus said, no man can do it. It's not possible. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't, you have to pick a side. You can't just, well, I'm going to serve both masters. Whether it's mammon, whether it's, you know, uh, friendships, whatever relationship it is, you have to choose. You have to pick. You have to pick a side. That's what loyalty is. And a lot of times people don't want to pay that price. They don't want to, they don't want to be loyal to anybody because they don't want to have to pick a side. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. It's impossible. You have to pick. You have to choose which one it's going to be. And what I love about this passage is that Jesus just tells us the obvious answer. And we, we find ourselves, well, you know, what should I do? Should it be, you know, the job or should it be the church? You know, what am I supposed to do? Should it be making money or serving God? Oh, I don't know what to do. Well, verse 25, Jesus just assumes we're going to make the right choice. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. I mean, he draws this decision. He draws the line in the sand and says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Just assuming we're going to make the right decision. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for, yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. You know, if, you have, if, you're, if you're in this position where you have to make this decision, choose Christ. You know, pledge your loyalty to him. Because there's more to life than just meat. There's more to life than just raiment. There's more to life than just mammon. Loyalty costs something. And loyalty is what's going to keep us in the battle. Loyalty is what's going to keep us fighting for the side we've chosen unto death. Loyalty isn't something, well, I'm going to be loyal for a little while, but then when things get hot, when things get heavy, when things get tough, then I'm going to skip out. Then I'm going to back off. Then I'm going to switch sides. That's not loyalty. Loyalty sticks with it. Loyalty goes all the way through, through thick, through thin, all the way, even when things get tough. Loyalty keeps us in the battle fighting for our side unto death. I mean, look at the loyalty of these soldiers in, in this story. Verse 15, Then there arose and went over uh, by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, 
the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by his head and thrust his, his, uh, his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. That's kind of a funny story. They're all going to fight. And there's, you know, there's a whole other sermon here about how when, you know, nobody wins in war, really. There's, it's just full of tragedy, right? But that's kind of a different subject. But just every time I read that story, it's just this, it's kind of humorous that they go down in there and they all at the same time grab each other by the head and they thrust each other through. You think, is that really, could that really happen? And I always think about when I was in like the fifth grade, I was in this program, this after school program called Odyssey of the Mind. Has anybody ever heard of that? No. Okay. Well, it was a thing. I'm not making this up. All right. It was called Odyssey of the Mind. And the, the program that we were doing was we were reenacting the, the uh, Pompeii when they got blown over by the volcano, that, that wicked town. They didn't tell us about that in fifth grade, that they were a bunch of pervert sodomites back then being judged by God. They were just like, oh, look at all this archaeology. But then we were trying to like, do this play where we reenacted it. And I played the part of like a soldier, I think. And then I had a friend, and he played the part of like a slave who was getting, like, we were the only two left after the, the, the volcano came through. Everybody else died, but somehow we miraculously lived. And the, the climax of the story, this is fifth graders, people, was, uh, you know, we were going to have the sword fight. You know, and I had my sword, and he had his sword. And we were, we, we practiced, and we were practicing, and then we looked at the teacher like, well, who gets to win? And she's like, well, we'll just see what happens. <laughs> she didn't like, you know, she was talking about no loyalty, you know, and this lady couldn't make a decision either. She's just like, well, we'll just see what happens. So we like get to the day where like we go to the local community college. We, we're all in the auditorium. We're like, we got to act this out. We got our costumes on and it comes down to the big battle at the end. And it's just like this story. He and I both just poof, and we looked at each other and then we both fell down dead. <laughs> Every time I read that story, I think about it. So I had to share it with you. But anyway. So that kind of thing can happen. That's my proof for that, you know, this, this story that I have. I think about that. These guys, you know, but they, they get on the grab each other by the head, and they all thrust through their fellow, and they, they fall down, and they all die. But, you know, that's their loyalty. You know, they, they didn't question orders. They just followed orders to the death. They went in there and just fought and died. You know, we here, in, in, you know, uh, we've never had our loyalty probably tested like that as Christians. You know, we, we've never had that, but there's a possibility that we might. There's a possibility that maybe one day we will see some real persecution and not just, you know, Facebook changing its, its, its logo to the rainbow colors. So I'm talking actual real persecution. You know, maybe somebody might even throw a bomb through a, a, into a church, right? That could happen. It might even get to the place, if you would, go over to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2 where our lives are on the line. And you know, there, that has happened throughout history. Many times over, there's been people that have actually had to choose, am I willing to lay down my life for Christ? They've had their loyalty tested to that degree. We need to follow orders unto death. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, and the angel of the church of, uh, in Smyrna, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, uh, write, these things saith the first and last, he which is dead and is alive, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast you, some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. That's how faithful God wants us to be, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know, we talk. Sometimes you hear people talk, and I've even said it, I'm sure, in the in past, like, oh, I die for Christ. I'm willing to lay down. You know, and I've jokingly said things like that in the past. Oh, you know, if they start chopping off heads, I'll be the first one in line. I'll be saying, is this the line for, for the beheading? You mind if I cut? <laughs> right? Now I say, but here's the thing. What if that really happened? Can it, you know, that's when, what if my loyalty really was tested? And I, I, well, I'd hope so. I'd hope I'd be that loyal. But let me tell you the person who's not going to be the loyal. The person who's not going to die for Christ is the person who won't live for Christ. People talk, oh, I'm going to die for Christ. You won't even live for him. Well, tell me you're going to die for Christ if you can't even live for Christ. You can't even live for your Christ. If you can't even be loyal to him, you know, when everything's going good, no way you're going to be loyal when everything gets bad. When they start cutting off heads or whatever. We need to be loyal unto death. Because here's the thing, if that's how loyal we are, you know, we'll be loyal even just in the hard circumstances. If you want to go back to our story, 
we'll look at another example of loyalty in this chapter, the loyalty of the children of Benjamin. Remember, that was who, uh, you know, Abner had. That was who was on his side. And it says there, and there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten. So this after everyone kills himself for the pool, right? And the men of Israel before the servants of David, and there was three sons of Zeruiah there, Joab and Abish- Abishai and Asahel. And Asahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. And then, of course, we know the story there. He pursues Abner. Abner tells him to turn away. He doesn't want to harm him because he's Joab's brother. And he ends up he persisting and pursuing him. And then he turns and he runs him through with the spear and kills him. Okay, that comes up later. Jump down to verse 24. Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner. So after they find Asahel dead, they keep going after him. And the sun went down and they were come to the hill of Amma that lieth before Gaia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. So Abner's on the run and things aren't going well. He gets beat. And they're running for their lives, you know, and they're hot on their heels, and they're mad about their brother. And it says in verse 25, and the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner. They didn't say, oh man, we're, we got beat. We're, we're being pursued. Every man for himself. Let's jump ship. Everybody just go home. Just get away from uh, Abner. No, it says there that these men gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop. They were united. You know, they got together, they became one troop, and stood on the top of an hill. You know, so they had some, you know, logistical advantages here. They were on top, at least the top of a hill, but they were vastly outnumbered. You know, it didn't matter how the day had gone, they stood their ground. And that's what loyalty is. It doesn't just go, I'm going to be loyal today. Well, let's see which way the wind's blowing. Let me see how everything's going. How is this going to play out? Loyalty is loyal unto death. Loyalty is you're loyal through the hard times, even when the you know the odds are stacked against you. They're still loyal unto Abner. That's I, that's what I'm looking at. That's what I see here, is that these men of Benjamin, they were loyal to Abner. They were the, in fact the only tribe that kind of stuck it out. I mean, read verse eight again. And Abner the son of Ner, the captain of Saul's host, took Ebosheth the son of Saul and brought him over to Maenaim. And made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and the Je- and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all Israel. So where's all these other guys? Where's everybody else that went out to war that day? Just gone. But the men of Benjamin, they stuck it out. Even when things weren't going well, even when things were tough, they say, you know what? We're going to stick by Abner's side. We're going to gather together as one troop to the death. That's loyalty. They didn't go, boy, Abner, that was a stupid call, going out there and sitting down at the pool and having everybody fight. That was really dumb of you to go out and try and take on, you know, David's men. No, they just stuck it out with him. Because <clears throat> true loyalty <clears throat> isn't based on circumstance. That's not loyalty. Well, I'll be loyal as long as everything goes my way. I'll, go, I'll be loyal as long as everything, you know, is, is to my liking. That's not loyalty. You know, husbands and wives aren't loyal to one another until one of them does something stupid or makes a mistake. No one would stick together. Everyone would be divorced if that were the case. <clears throat> True loyalty isn't based on circumstance. And he, let me, you know, and this is important for us to understand. And I, I hope this is getting through tonight because, you know, in, in case you haven't noticed, things aren't getting better in this world. They are getting worse. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we're in case you know Pride Month isn't you know enough isn't obvious enough of how bad things are getting in this country, and how bad they've gotten already. I mean, good night. I was talking to somebody the other last night about the way it was in the '80s, back in the '80s, and he made this point. He's like, you know, people today, the the generation today is looking back at us that grew up in the '80s, like we look back. Like, Back at people that grew up grew up in the 40s. You see what I'm saying? The younger generation today, they look at my generation that grew up in the 80s, and it's like my generation in the 80s looking back on people that grew up in the 40s. That gave me some perspective because I mean, think about how much things changed from the 40s to the 80s. Think about how much things have changed from the 80s in one lifetime, not even a lifetime, until now. I mean, the things that are going on now are, are just weren't even thought of back then. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. You might as well settle where your loyalty lies with Christ or with this world now 
because things aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse. Well, how do you know that? Because that's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. We like all that. Verse 11, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at verse 13. But evil men and seducers are just going to stay the same. It's, not, it's always going to be the same degree of wickedness in the world. No, he said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse before it gets better. It's, it'll get better when Jesus comes. It'll be as good as it's ever been. It'll be as good as it possibly could be when Christ comes. But until then, it's going to get worse and worse. So you might as well decide. You might as well just decide tonight, now, where your loyalty lies. Is it with Christ or is it with this world? That's going to get worse and worse and worse. But mark it down. If you choose, hey, it's going to be with Christ. I'm going to be loyal to him. I'm going to serve him. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That loyalty is going to come at a price. It's going to put you at odds with the world. <clears throat> you know, and while we're there, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. While we're on the subject of loyalty, you know, disloyalty <clears throat> is actually an attribute of what I call, you know, an end times attitude. Bible warns us that people are going to be, there's going to be certain attributes that are, you know, amplified in the end times. Look at verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Now, men have always been these things. But I believe he's saying it's going to be even worse. They're going to wax worse and worse. They're going to be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. And what's verse 4 say? Traitors. What's a traitor? Somebody who's disloyal. You know, if we're, if we're disloyal to Christ, we're like these people. Look, I don't want to share anything in common with these people. I don't want to be a traitor. I don't want to be a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. I don't want to be unthankful and holy. I don't want to be disobedient to parents. I don't want to be proud, a blasphemer. I don't want to be any of these things. So if you don't want to be any of these things, one of the things you have to learn to be in this life is to be loyal and to not be a traitor. So if loyalty is what's going to define us even in the face of hardship, what we're going to see is that it has a very powerful impact on other people. That's is what I want to close on, the last example of loyalty here. And that loyalty is that of Saul, King Saul, the man who's in this chapter has already died. But Saul was loyal early on in his ministry, early rather on his, in his reign. Soil was lo Saul was loyal to the men of Jabesh Gilead, who started out the chapter, right? If you would, uh, well, I'll just remind us of 1 Samuel. No, go to 1 Samuel chapter 11. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 11. It's, it's right there. The loyalty of Saul and the men of Jabesh Gilead. That's the last example tonight. I know it's two different people, but they're inter. They're intertwined. It's, it's their, their, their story is interwoven. <clears throat> the loyalty of Saul and the men of J Jabesh Gilead. Because remember in the beginning of the chapter, they said, here are the men of J Jabesh Gilead that have buried Saul. And remember, they went to uh, the town of the Philistines and they'd taken Saul's beheaded body off of the wall. Remember when Saul died, they came and desecrated his body and then they nailed his body to the wall. And they put his head in, I think it was in the god of Ashtaroth or something like that. Remember how they nailed his body to the wall? And it was the men of Jabesh Gilead that went there at night and took his body down and buried it. What, can, what possessed them to do that? Loyalty is what did that. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4, this is the beginning of Saul's reign before he went bad. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. Remember how they were told, uh, the, guy, the guy's name escapes me right now, but he came and he said, hey, we're going to put your eyes out. We want to put out one of your right eyes. And they, I think it was your, maybe it was the right eye, maybe it was the left, I can't remember. But he said, hey, well, let us send messengers throughout all the land, and if nobody comes to rescue us, you know, after three days, we'll come out and you can do whatever you want to us. 
So they send, they send all these messengers out, and one of them comes to Saul. Nobody else came to there you know, to deliver them. It was just Saul. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field and said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul, and he heard those things, and his anger was kindled greatly. And then he rallies Israel and goes and delivers the men of Jabesh Gilead. You know, he cuts up his ox and he says, Whoever doesn't come with me, so shall it be done unto their ox. And they all say, well, we don't want to lose any oxen. So they all come. But it was, it was Saul who decided, I'm going to go deliver these people, these men of Jabesh Gilead, from this oppression. You know, and that act that he did in the beginning of his reign made such an impression on those people that he was loyal to his own nation like that, that after, his, after all the things that he did, all the things that he did wrong, in fact, they still came and honored him for having done that and took his body down. That's why they did that. That's what I believe. They remember the goodness that he did to them. They said, you know what? We're going to be loyal to Saul, and we're going to risk our own necks, and we're going to go over there, and we're going to take his body down and bury it. But here's the thing about Saul's loyalty. He was loyal when it counted. He was loyal. Oh, I'm with you, the man of Jabesh Gilead. Okay, good, because we got some people here that want to thrust our eyes out. We got some people here that want to do us harm. Oh, sorry, never mind. Yeah, that whole loyalty thing, never mind. You know, Saul was loyal. And loyalty is only, only, you know, it has to be tested in order to be proven. That's how you know when somebody's loyal, when it's actually tested. And Saul was loyal when it counted. When somebody needed his help, when someone needed somebody to come deliver them, Saul said, I'll be there. I'll come help you. And in return, the men of Jabesh Gilead were loyal to Saul in his death. And what that tells me is that, you know, loyalty looks past faults. Because from the time he delivered Jabesh Gilead to the time he died, Saul did a lot of things wrong. He's going to the witch at Endor. He's not, you know, killing King Agag. He's not killing the Amalekites. He's pursuing David. You know, he's, he did a lot of things wrong that the men of Jabesh Gilead knew about. But you know what? Loyalty looks past faults in people. Because here's the thing. Nobody's perfect. And loyalty lets things go. Now, I'm not saying blind loyalty to the point where we just excuse, you know, just blatant sin or something like that. Well, you know, some things, obviously, we have to break fellowship. We have to call it out. I get that, okay? But, you know, we can look past faults. You know, maybe the men of Jabesh Gilead had some issues with Saul, but they said, you know what? He's dead. He's desecrated. Let's not let him just be this trophy for the heathen. Let's go at least do him some honor and bury his body. Let's at least be that loyal to some degree. Despite his faults, they could have easily just said, yeah, you know what? I mean, we appreciate what he did for us in the past, but he kind of had it coming. You saw what he did. So what if his body's up there? <clears throat> look, loyalty can look past faults in people. They can look past and say, you know what? I know you're not perfect, but I'm going to remain loyal to you. Because here, again, if that's, the, if that's the, uh, the price of loyalty, you have to be perfect for me to be loyal to you. You're not going to be loyal to anybody because nobody's perfect. <clears throat> You say, well, I don't know if it's worth it. Is it really worth paying the price to be loyal? Is it really worth being loyal to somebody? I mean, wouldn't you like somebody to be there when, when, at the, in, when you have a hard time, when you're going through something tough? Wouldn't you like to have some loyal friends around? They're going to help you and guide you and take care of you and see you through things and, and do things for you? Yeah, I know I do. I hope if I'm ever down and out or if I'm in, in some kind of a jam or something, there's somebody that is loyal to me that's going to come alongside and say, hey, can I help you out? You know, and I want to be the same way for other people. I want to be loyal to them. Even if they have faults, even if they do things I don't agree with, I can just look past it. I don't sit there and point it out. I can just, you know, be loyal when it counts, when it really matters. But again, loyalty is going to come at a price. It's not going to come cheap, you know, and it's going to be tested. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Well, consider this. The men of Jabesh Gilead earned the favor of the king by their loyalty. You know, in the beginning of the story, that's what he said to him. Let's just look at it real quick before we close. And it said there uh, <clears throat> in verse, we'll just look at verse, uh, well, where is it? Where did I go? Oh, first page two, sorry. 
verse 2, And David sent messengers to Jabesh Gilead and said to them, Blessed be ye of the Lord. For what they did, for their loyalty to Saul, now the king is saying, Blessed be ye of the Lord. I mean, isn't that what we want in our life? I'm not saying King David. I'm saying the king of kings. Do you want the king of kings to look down on you and say, Blessed be ye of the Lord for the, you know, for the, for the kindness you've shown to somebody else who was, you know, who couldn't do anything about it? Well, you know, if that's what we want, then you have to realize that it has to be proven. And that, you know, that comes at a price. And that price is loyalty. It's not going to make you popular. Loyalty is not going to make you popular with everybody. It's going to put you at odds with people. But you know what? That loyalty will be reciprocated by the people to whom you are loyal. And it will gain you the favor of the king. Let's go ahead and pray.